Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 14th chapter. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled, and they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. The Gospel of the Lord. In today's Gospel lesson, Jesus feeds some 5,000 people. It's actually more like 10,000 since the Gospel lesson says that there were 5,000 men, but it doesn't number how many women and children were also present. It's the only miracle of Jesus recorded in all four Gospels. And in two out of the four Gospels, it appears twice actually with slightly different details. And so what is it about this particular miracle of Jesus that deserves so much attention. Well, certainly this feeding narrative contains the most obvious of points that Jesus, the one who provides the mass meal, is himself the very bread of life. John's gospel, the story says that specifically, just as our bodies need food to live, so our very souls must feed on Jesus as the source of all life. Well, there's another take on the story that also is a good point. The disciples come to Jesus and they state the dilemma. Jesus, it's dinner time and these people are hungry. Send them into the village so they can eat. And Jesus says to them, you feed them. Well, it's a simple extraction then to hear the words of Jesus to you and me, telling us to do things as his people, as a church, things that are seemingly impossible and yet even against formidable, if not impossible odds, we are to go out and do just that. How often in the church do we dismiss an idea simply because we have decided it is too big of a job for us to accomplish? Jesus says, go do it anyway and see what happens. There are hungry people in the world, feed them. Jesus directs us. But Lord, we can't possibly take on such a task. There there are just too many, it's too overwhelming. Jesus says, Don't let the impossible enormity of a task stop you from ever trying. Well, I want to focus on a different angle of the gospel lesson today, the part of the gospel lesson that says not only were 10,000 fed with five loaves and two fish, but that after they had all eaten, after they'd all have a chance at seconds, there were still 12 baskets of leftovers. So either Jesus is very poor at estimating quantity, which is unlikely, or the 12 baskets of leftovers are there to emphasize the overabundance of what happens when Jesus gets involved in our lives. Kind of an exclamation mark at the end of any encounter with him. And so let me just throw out a simple and obvious couple questions. Where did all that food come from? How did Jesus take a small sack of food and turn it into the largest buffet the world has ever known. But at the very least, the how of it should pique our interest. And while we may conclude that it doesn't really matter how Jesus accomplishes this, just that he did, we can still take the story and applying it to our own lives, ask a few questions. Does Jesus still perform miracles today? Does Jesus still perform miracles in my life? And if so, then why don't I notice them? Are there miracles just as profound as the feeding of the 5,000 plus 
including the overtop conclusion of 12 baskets of leftover? Is all that going on right now in my life and I'm just not noticing it? For if Jesus is present here and present with me, as I hope and believe he is, when I walk out of here, I wanna believe that he is in my life acting in the same way that he, he has acted in our gospel lesson today. So what if God's miracles are all around us? That not a single day goes by in your life or mine that God isn't working some sort of miraculous power, amazing things are happening right under our spiritual noses and under our physical noses too. And just because we may not be aware of such things, it doesn't mean they aren't actually taking place. So I wanna offer you two ideas or a couple ideas that will help you become more available to the miracles that God is performing in your life. First, don't confuse miracle with magic. Which, what Jesus did on that hillside of our gospel lesson, it had nothing to do with abracadabra or hocus pocus. He didn't speak some divine incantation over the bread. He simply blessed it. Miracle involves openness to what we refer to in faith language as mystery. It is the welcoming of surprise in our life and it is the acceptance of those realities over which we have no control. Now magic, on the other hand, is the attempt to be in control, to manipulate everything and like every magician's trick, to feel that deep need to figure out how the magic happened, to offer some logical explanation for it. You see, faith aligns not with magic and the efforts to control or manipulate, but with miracle and the experience of mystery. According to a wise Hasidic Jew, miracle is this, simply the wonder of something unique that points us back to the wonder of everyday life. There's a story told about a monk who lived in the remote mountains of northern Greece. He had, he had desired all his life to make a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, to the Holy Sepulchre, actually, the place of Jesus' burial. And what he wanted to do is he wanted to get there, and he wanted to walk three times around the Holy Sepulchre. He wanted to kneel and then to return home a new person. Gradually through the years, he saved enough money, what money he could, begging in the villages nearby. And finally, near the end of his life, he had saved enough, set enough aside to begin his trip. And so he opened the gates of the monastery and with staff in hand, he set out with great anticipation on his way to Jerusalem. But no sooner had he left the cloister that the monk encountered a man in rags, sad and bent to the ground, picking herbs. Where are you going, sir? The man asked. To the Holy Sepulchre, brother. By God's grace, I shall walk three times around it, kneel and return home a different man from what I am. Well, how much money do you have to do that? Inquired the man. 30 pounds, the monk answered. Give me 30 pounds, said the beggar. I have a wife and hungry children. Give me the money. Walk three times around me and then kneel and go back into your monastery. Well, the monk thought for a moment, scratching the ground with his staff, and, and then he took the 30 pounds from his sack and he gave the whole of it to the poor man. He walked three times around him. He knelt and he went back through the gates of the monastery. He returned home, a new person, of course, having recognized that the beggar was actually Christ himself, not in some magical, far away place, but right outside his own monastery door, mysteriously close in his own backyard, in abandoning his quest for the remote, the special, the somehow magical, the monk discovered a meaning far more profound in the ordinary experience closer to home. All that he had given up came suddenly rushing back to him with a pure joy that he had not anticipated. You see, asking God to perform some sort of magic in our lives is to miss the miracles already present around us. 
We, we find miracles only when we stop looking for magic. We find miracles when we begin to see all of life as mystery, not mystery to be solved, but mystery to be lived. And then secondly, here's another way to make yourself more available to the miracles that surround you. Expect what you expect. The expectations of the large crowd when they first heard that Jesus had in mind to, to feed them, those expectations must have been pretty low. For when the disciples produced only five loaves of bread and two small fish, there must have been those who concluded that they were glad they weren't very hungry because, honey, five loaves and two small fish are not going to go very far. And yet that crowd on that hillside gathered with great expectations of this Jesus. They had heard about him. They, they had traveled far and wide to see and to hear this Jesus. And the reason they were there in the first place was because they had come to associate Jesus with some extraordinary things. He had healed their sick. He had this uncanny way of getting them to think about the potential of their lives. And more than anything else, they sensed in him a compassion unlike any other for the hurt and the brokenness that they were experiencing. The people on the hillside that day had learned to expect great and unusual things from this Jesus. And one of the reasons why he was able to satisfy them was because they approached him with such great expectation. Well, some of us have given up expecting anything from Jesus. There is nothing we long to receive from God. We've become bitter because God didn't come through with the miracle that we decided we needed. And we became so focused on looking for the miracle that didn't happen that we missed the ones that did. And because of our disappointment and our disillusionment, we've just given up on the idea of miracle altogether. One thing we can learn from our gospel lesson that will enable us to be blessed again by miracles is that we need to reclaim an expectant spirit. If we need physical or spiritual sustenance, we need to come before Jesus, expecting that these needs will be met. If it's comfort in the midst of grieving or in the midst of trauma that we're after, then, then we need to come expecting that that's what we'll receive. And if we're seeking forgiveness or renewal, then we need to come to God expecting that God is ready and willing and able to deliver that which we need. Oh, it's true. Often a miracle will come in other ways than we could ever have imagined, but we go expecting the God of faithfulness will be faithful even to us. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that the miracles of God happen or don't happen depending on our attitude, but our attitude or our expectation of God's miracles in our lives will most certainly make us available to experience the miracles when they do come. Expect what you expect. Let me close with one last story. A certain person a certain person wished to see the miracles of God, but seemed incapable of achieving this spiritual goal. And the person approached a noble saint, imploring the wise advice of a sage. And the saint said, my child, this evening, eat a lot of salted fish, then perform your prayers and go to bed without drinking any water. And then you will see. Well, the person followed the advice of the noble saint and spent the whole night dr uh, dreaming of drinking from streams and fountains and springs. And when morning came, the person ran crying to the saint, I have not seen any miracles in my life. I was so thirsty that all I dreamed about was drinking from fountains and springs. I am still on fire with thirst. The saint then said, so eating salted fish gave you such a thirst that you dreamed all night of nothing but water. Now you must experience such a thirst for seeing the miracles of God in your life and you will then behold them.
The people of Argospolis and came to that hillside hungering and thirsting after something or someone to fill up the emptiness in their lives. What they found was Jesus, who not only could fill their bellies with bread and fish, but their souls with living bread. So I, I just have one question for you. How hungry are you? Amen.